guys, how's it going? Welcome to another video lecture. This one is going to be all about the ladies. Yes, we just talked about the Industrial Revolution. I had a lot of fun doing that video lecture with you guys, and there were a lot of great questions during our live Zoom um, class last Friday, so that was really great. This one is all about the women, and our question that we're going to examine this week is, how were women affected by the Industrial Revolution? In doing that, we're not going to look at every single woman in the United States at the time. We're actually going to just focus on one town in the United States, particularly a town created by a man named Francis Cabot Lowell, L-O-W-E-L-L. -L. And he would set up a town where he would create textile mills or textile factories, whatever you want to call them. And there he hired women from all around the countryside to come and work at his mill and the town was set up as a working town where people would come to live there and work there and that was it people didn't have vacation homes in lowell massachusetts people came there to live and work and when they were done working they moved back home okay so here's the rubric that we're looking at so when you write your answer to this question and again all of this will be filled out momentarily um, provide an introduction. Now, I'll probably give you an introduction in the assignment that you got this video from anyway, so we'll focus on that later. The next thing I want you to do is answer this question, why did the women come to work at the Lowell Mill? Then I want you to tell me, what were the conditions at the mill like? Then finally, I want you to tell me, what were the effects on women? We're going to go over all of that today, so don't feel like you need to know that Right now, we're going to go over all of that. I'd like to read some documents about this Lowell Mill. Now, I only have two for you this time. One is from 1836, and the other is from, let me take a look here, 1889. These women were going to work in the Lowell Mills in the early 19th century. By 1889, the Lowell Mill is a powerhouse. Uh, they have thousands of girls working there from the ages of 15 to 35. What I want to do is read these documents, and then when we're done reading these documents, I want to go back and go over everything with you so that you can provide a good answer. Remember, please do not just type this question into Google and copy and paste. I'm not going to accept that from anybody. Okay. So this first document is called Female Workers of Lowell. The Harbinger Magazine, November 14th, 1836. So this is a magazine in 1836, and the article focuses on the female workers of Lowell. And by the way, before we start, all the workers in the mill were women. There were no men there. All right, we'll get into why it was all women in just a moment, but I really want to read these documents first. Okay. We have lately visited the cities of Lowell and Manchester, and have had an opportunity of examining the factory more closely than before. We had distrusted the accounts which we had heard from persons engaged in labor reform now beginning to agitate New England. We could scarcely credit the statements made in relation to the exhausting nature of the labor in the mills, and to the manner in which the young women, the operatives, lived in their boarding houses, six sleeping in a room, poorly ventilated." Okay, so this is telling us that this, the journalists who are writing for this magazine, the writers, they're going into the mill and they want to see what's really going on. And the first thing that they tell us is that the women who worked at the Lowell Mill lived in boarding houses, much like a dormitory at college. But they said six women were sleeping in a room and it was poorly ventilated, meaning there weren't a lot of windows to open up and get some fresh air. It was crowded. It was cramped. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I really don't like being in rooms like that. I have allergies. I get, you know, dryness in my sinuses. So right off the bat, it sounds like the women were in these crummy boarding houses, these crummy dormitories. Let's keep reading. We went through many of the mills, talked particularly to a large number of the operatives, and ate at their boarding houses on purpose to ascertain. I love that word. Ascertain means to understand or to figure out on purpose to ascertain by personal inspection the facts of the case. We assure our readers that very little information is possessed and no correct judgments formed by the public at large of our factory system, which is the first germ of the industrial or commercial feudalism that has spread over our land. 
all right, so the journalists there are basically saying, like, we dove in and we can tell you, you guys who aren't in a factory system, you don't know anything about it. So we're going to tell you in this article. Keep reading. The operatives work 13 hours a day in the summertime and from daylight to dark in the winter. At half past four in the morning, the factory bell rings, and at five, the girls must be in the mills. A clerk placed as a watch observes those who are a few minutes behind the time, and effectual means are taken to stimulate the punctuality. I guess that must be the punctuality. Punctuality meaning uh, being there on time, being punctual. This is the morning commencement of the industrial discipline, should we rather not say industrial tyranny, which is established in these associations of this moral and Christian community. So basically what they're saying is these women are working crazy long hours, and it's like the military. The moment that bell goes, women file out of their boarding houses, they file into the mill, and then they don't stop working until late at night, and then they file back out. Keep reading. At 7, the girls are allowed 30 minutes for breakfast, and at noon, 30 minutes more for dinner except during the first quarter of the year when the time is extended to 45 minutes. But within this time, they must hurry to their boarding houses and return to the factory. And that through the hot sun or the hot, excuse me, or the rain or the cold, a meal eaten under such circumstances must be quite unfavorable to digestion and health, as any medical man will inform us. After 7 o'clock in the evening, the factory bell sounds the close of the day's work. So you got to understand, guys. These women get half an hour to go eat, but they have to rush to their boarding house, make a meal real quick. They're, they can't, like, stop at McDonald's. They didn't exist. There was no fast food. There were no fast options. They had to run home, make something real quick so it can't be that great, eat it, and then rush back in. I don't know about you, but if you've ever had gym class right after lunch and you went full, throat, full throttle and then you felt it in your stomach, it's not a good combination. So this doesn't sound so great so far. When capital has got 13 hours of labor daily out of a being, it can get nothing more. It would be a poor speculation in an industrial point of view to own the operative for the trouble and expense of providing for the times of sickness and old age would more than counterbalance the difference between the price of wages and the expenses of boarding and clothing. The far greater number of fortunes accumulated by the North in comparison with the South shows that hiring labor is more profitable for capital than slave labor. Okay, so two things that they say in that paragraph. The top where it says, when capital has gotten 13 hours of labor daily out of a being, it can get nothing more. What they're saying is, these women are worked to the absolute limits of their capacity. 13 hours a day, there's only 24 hours of the day, you're supposed to spend 8 of those sleeping. So... You know, working 13 hours a day with little breaks for lunch, breakfast, and dinner doesn't sound that great. So the journalists are saying, hey, these are not great conditions. But they also point out that hiring labor is more profitable than slave labor. So they make a point to say, hey, hiring these girls who are working their tails off makes more money for the factory owner, the Lowell family, than they would having slaves. So an argument against slavery, even though you could argue these women having to work at this level, it's not the same as slavery, but it's close to it. It's not great. Keep reading. Now let us examine the nature of the labor itself and the conditions under which it is performed. Enter with us into the large rooms where the looms, those are the big machines that make the textiles, are at work. The din and clatter of these 500 looms under full operation struck us on first entering as something frightful and infernal, for it seems such an atrocious violation of one of the faculties of the human soul, the sense of hearing. I like that sentence because when they say it's such an atrocious violation on the faculties of the human soul, what they're saying is this this noise that the mill makes, it's it so violates one's peace and quiet now look, you work, things are going to be a little more intense than sleeping in your bed at night, but they said it, your, your ears, the, your sense of hearing, it's just so overwhelming that it's difficult to deal with. After a while, we became somewhat used to it, and by speaking quite close to the ear of an operative and quite loud, we could hold a conversation and make the inquiries we wished. Okay, so they said, there's giant 
looms at work. They're so loud. If you want to talk to somebody, you got to get right into their ear and basically shout for them to hear you. That's the only way you can be heard. 13 hours a day of listening to that. That's insane. I, I, I mean, I think it might drive me nuts. So that's part of the conditions that they faced. The girls attended upon an average of three looms. Many attended four, but this requires a very active person and the most unremitting care. However, a great many do it. Attention to two as as much as should be demanded of an operative. This gives us some idea of the application required during the 13 hours of daily labor. The atmosphere of such a room cannot, of course, be pure. On the contrary, it is charged with cotton filaments and dust, which we are told are very injurious to the lungs. All right, so lots of these girls are attending four looms when the journalists are saying they should only really, at most be dealing with two, and that's the most they should be dealing with. But a lot of these girls are doing three, maybe four. That's not good. You know, how much can you pay attention to detail? How much can that drive a person nuts? They go on to say, the room is charged with cotton filaments and Dutch, uh, dust, which are injurious to the lungs. Yeah, guys, you don't want to be breathing that stuff in because it gets into your lungs and it can make you really, really sick and difficult to breathe. On entering the room, although the day was warm, we remarked that the windows were down. We asked the reason, and a young woman answered very naively, and without seeming to be the least aware of the privation of fresh air was anything else than perfectly natural, that when the wind blew, the threads did not work well. Okay, so they can't even open the window, because if they do, the looms don't work well, so girls are fainting. I mean... I don't like to be in the classroom when it's hot, and all I'm really doing is talking and managing the classroom. Can you imagine working on a giant machine when it's that warm? The young women sleep upon an average six in a room, three beds to a room. There is no privacy, no retirement here. It is almost impossible to read or write alone as the parlor is full and so many sleep in the same chamber. A young woman remarked to us, that if she had a letter to write, she did it on the head of a bandbox, sitting on a trunk as there was no space for a table. So basically, you can't sit at a desk and write anything. You've got to write it on like a little box or something to write a, a letter to a loved one. Six in a room, three beds to a room, so they're sharing beds. No privacy whatsoever. It's impossible to read or write alone. That on top of working all of that time, I think would drive me a little nuts keep reading so live and toil the young women of our country in the boarding houses and manufactories which the rich and influential of our land have built for them okay so that was a little insight into what it was like to be in those factories let's look at why women went there in the first place and then what the factories were actually like okay well why did women work at the Lowell Mill well Usually, it was to help their families with an additional source of income. Usually, these women came from New England farms in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and places like that, and they wanted to help their family who didn't have much money working on the farm, so they went and did this. Other times, women went to save for a marriage, either for themselves or for a sibling. If their brother was getting married, they would go work and save up money so that the brother could leave and buy a house and, and provide for his family. And another reason was free housing. The women didn't have to rent an apartment or buy a house to go work there. The housing was free. And so a lot of women went for that reason. Now let's talk about what was the Lowell Mill actually like? Well, as we read in that last document, the mills and the dormitories were cramped and dirty. Girls often had to work multiple looms at once, which as that last article told us, that's really difficult to do. Open windows caused looms to malfunction, so it was very hot and girls often fainted. And then you had short meal times, long hours, and low wages. All of this does not sound very good. Now before we get into the actual effects of this, let's read one more article about the Lowell Mill. This is an excerpt from The Lowell Offering by Harriet H. Robinson from New England Magazine, 
Volume 7, Issue 4, December 1889. So this is an article in a magazine, and this is just an excerpt. This isn't the whole thing. Let's see what we can learn from this source. While the majority of the younger girls were farmers' daughters, there were a few who were not country girls. Lucy Larkham came from Beverly, her mother being the widow of a sea captain, and my own mother moved from Boston, my native place, in 1832 with her little flock of fatherless children to open a boarding house and thus earn their bread and give them a better education than she could earn for them in Boston. So there you go. Not everyone uh, who was there was just doing it for their family. Sometimes they had no family. And so, you know, they had to start over. Maybe they were a widow. You know, there was no man to earn income. So these women had to go work for themselves because there was no man to provide for them. And unfortunately, that's the way things were in those days. Uh, not to sound sexist, but that's just the nature of uh, life in, the, in America in the 19th century. There was a lot of dependence on men. Keep reading. Most of these women, both young and old, had some object in working in the factory besides using the money they would earn for mere dress and adornments. Some desired to become better educated. Others worked at it so that a brother or a son might be sent to college and still others to maintain the younger children or the father and mother on the home farm. But there were not a few who came to Lowell on account of circulating libraries that were soon opened. Aha! The Lyceum Lectures, and the social advantages to be found in the companionship of those of similar tastes with themselves. And there is no doubt that the society of one, of one another was a great advantage to these girls. They discussed the books they read. Debated, debated religious and social questions, compared their own thoughts and experiences, and advised and helped one another. And so their mental growth went on, and they soon became educated far beyond what their mothers or their grandmothers could have been. I want to stop right there. The fact that they had libraries, the fact that they had night classes, and the fact that they could talk to other women that were in similar circumstances meant that these women got an education that their ancestors never got. Because women weren't allowed to go to universities in those days. But now that they're getting this education, both socially and academically, at the Lowell Mill, they're able to gain a level of independence that their ancestors never had. That's a step forward. That's historic. Keep reading. It was fortunate for them that they were obliged to read good books, such as histories, the English classics, and very few American novels that were then in existence. Cheap editions of Scott were but just publishing. Frederica Bremer was hardly translated. Harriet Beecher Stowe was busy in her nursery, and the great American novel was not yet written, nor yet the small one, which was indeed a great blessing. Okay, so the second half of that, they're naming authors who uh, would eventually rise in American literature, but the point is, these women had access to literature from all around the world, and they didn't have access to that in any other place during this time because, again, they weren't allowed at universities. Keep reading. It was not long before the numbers of these girls began to feel the benefit of educational advantages which had been open to them. They had learned much at the evening schools, attending the Lyceum lectures, and continued their studies during their yearly vacation or kept them up while at work in the mill. Their work was monotonous and was done almost mechanically. But their thoughts were free, and they had ample time to digest what they learned, or to think over what they had read. Their minds were not crammed, and an idea had a chance to turn around before another came to crowd or take its place. So this is interesting. It's saying these women, because they're working such monotonous jobs, meaning such um, mindless jobs, they're free to think about everything that they were learning in their lectures, or reading at the library, or reading in their book clubs. And that gave them the ability to process everything that they were learning. School needs more of that. You know, you go, to, you go to science class, then you come to history class, then you go to math, then you go to English, and you don't really get time to digest what you just learned. And that can be frustrating because we don't all learn instantaneously. We learn over time. And that's why I try to give you guys a week to do these questions because I really want you to think about it. I don't want you to just you know, take this in and go, all right, here's my answer. Think about it. Take your time. You know, really think. And I think that's better for you than just, just saying, all right, give me an instant answer. I don't think people really work like that. Um, 
you know, there's stories about girls at the Lowell Mill, by the way, who are doing this monotonous work. They would hide books in their aprons. And very often, if you went onto the mill floor, the factory floor, you could see a, a girl picking out of her apron a book and she'd be caught reading while the looms were working. They were taking advantage of their education and they weren't taking it for granted. Keep reading. In 1836, Miss Harriet F. Curtis and a few of her immediate associates conceived the idea of forming a little society for mutual improvement, where they could meet together at stated intervals and submit to each other what they had written or talk over the books that they had read. The society was regularly organized with officers, a constitution, bylaws, and its object was declared to be a desire on the part of its members to improve the talents God had given them. Miss Curtis was the president of this society, which had a, the first women's club on record, at least in this country. So women who were second-class citizens in our society at that time start to form their own little clubs, their own little societies where they can improve themselves. That's a step forward for women during this time. That's significant. That's historic. All right, so now that we've read these two documents, there's evidence in here that you can use in your question in the rubric that I've been showing you. Take a look at the rubric again. Introduction, why did the women come to work at the Lowell Mill? There's examples of that in our documents that we read. What were the conditions like? There were examples in there. Finally, what were the effects on women? Well, there's a few in our documents, but let me go over it with you now. Let's talk about some of the effects. Number one, women gained economic independence by earning their own money, even though this wasn't always the case. So women earn their own money. The reason I say it's not always the case is because if they were going to get married or if they were there on behalf of their family, that money was not theirs. It was either their father's or the eldest brother or their future husbands because in the 19th century and before it in America women could not have their own money that doesn't really happen until the late 19th century where women start to be able to have their own money and live on their own but it was considered taboo meaning um, not not appropriate for women to do that but working at the Lowell Mill was the start of that economic independence women earning their own money next they created the first union in the United States called the 10-hour union or the 10-hour movement. Remember how we said before that women were working 13 hours a day? Well, at one point, the women said this is too much. And they went to the Lowell family and said, you either change our workday to 10 hours or we won't work. We will go on strike. And you know what? The Lowell family said, okay. And they changed the workday to 10 hours, which is still a long time, but the women bargained for that they negotiated for that which is what a union does so the women at the Lowell Mill create the first union in the entire country amazing another effect was access to knowledge via the Lowell library and night classes because women weren't allowed at universities yet and as we said women took classes women went to the library they discussed books with each other this is all a huge step forward for women and women would never really look back this was the way it was from now on. Not for every woman, but it was the beginnings of that. And then finally, although factory girls were not considered, quote, feminine by many people at the time, excuse me, the Lowell workers helped to change the image of women as dependent upon men. See, for the longest time, women were considered to be dependent upon men. If you didn't have a man in your life, whether it was an older uh, a, a brother, a father, an uncle, cousin, or a husband, you had nothing because women weren't supposed to work. But now, because of the work at the Lowell Mill, women are allowed to live on their own and make their own money. And that gave them a certain level of freedom where they could eventually, not at the beginning, but they could eventually rent their own property, live where they wanted to, and not be so dependent on a man. There were many men in the 19th century who wouldn't date or marry factory girls because the idea was well that's not very feminine to do that but those early women were pioneers they had to break that image they had to break that mold that women were only uh, there to be dependent upon men 
now it's very common for women to work. Uh, my wife works. I grew up in a household where both my mom and my father both had jobs. That's very common these days, but it wasn't during the time of the Lowell Mill. Okay, guys, so now that we've done all that, the question is, how were women affected by the Industrial Revolution? Remember our rubric. Start out with an introduction, which I'll help provide for you. Tell me why did the women come to work at the Lowell Mill? What were the conditions like? And finally, what were the effects on women?